Hello and welcome to this week's episode of United Hour, the number one official, whatever you want to call it, redcafe.net podcast on all things Manchester United. I'm your host for today, Alex. I'm Nick. And that seems to be everyone. Um, it, it looks like me and Nick are the only ones who have have drank enough alcohol today and, and are willing to brave brave um, a discussion on Manchester United's 3-0 defeat at home to Tottenham Hotspur. Any thoughts, Nick, on on the cowardly fodder that, that is the rest of the podcast team? Well, that's it. I just think nobody else could handle two losses in a row. We know Imran doesn't do them when we lose anyway, so yeah, weren't expecting him to turn up, but uh, thought somebody else might be up for it. Imran feasts on depression and despair. It's so strange that he then uh, only seems... I think it must be that when things are so high and we're also positive he wants to bring us back down, but he feels like his work has been done by Mourinho or whoever for him this time, so so there's really no need. Um, now, it's it was a... A strange performance for us to commentate on. Obviously, it was a 3-0 loss, but I think the the attitude coming out of Old Trafford was somewhat mixed. And before we get started, I really want to cloud all your judgments of of Nick and everything he says through the rest of the podcast. And Nick, I want you to answer this openly and honestly and with minimal slash no excuses. When the whistle went last night, and Mourinho walked over to the fans and was applauding them as they applauded him back. Where were you? I was down the tunnel already, I'll say. Uh, but yeah, he wasn't He wasn't Shocking. applauding our end anyway. Shocking. He was over at the Stretford end, because that's closer to where they exit down the tunnel, whereas we're the opposite corner. Literally, that's we're the opposite convenient. corner to like uh, where the players' tunnel, yeah, in J-stand. Uh, but... Yeah, look, I was there till the final whistle, but yeah, I was straight out there soon after. There was quite a few who left as soon as that third goal went in. Uh, but yeah, just as yeah. many who stayed to, to clap and everything. And yeah, I guess I did. It was only afterwards I saw that Mourinho had stayed and everything. And uh, we could, well, I guess we'll talk about that after. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that later on. But it's just so disappointing. You know, you've built up this reputation both on Redcalf, on the forum, on, on the podcast for the last four years now as being this top red in with most, in with all these, these member trusts and foundations, meeting with ex-pros. And yet you weren't there when, <laughs> when we needed you. You were heading off on your way. Hey, to I was the there till the final the whistle, eh? <laughs> Just not good uh, enough, look, mate. It'd been a long it's, day. It's not good enough. And uh, like I said, I, I, to be honest, I did actually even consider for like, which would have only been the second time ever leaving before the final whistle. The last time before that was when we lost really? it to City. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was the only time I've ever left. So 6 1 to City is the on, only time you've left. And this was the closest to that in all this time. I mean, I think there probably was others, but it was just. I don't remember one where we got, you know, beaten by that margin at home. So the only one that comes to mind is that 6-1 City, yeah. man. So somebody might remind me of something else in the meantime. But yeah, I mean, I can remember worse games than like that. I remember things like losing to Coventry on a freezing cold night in the Carling Cup way back when. But yeah, like I say, that was the times when you just think like, all right, it's all done here. But yeah, did stay till the end just because there was sure. a good atmosphere. Like I say, a lot of people were trying to do that, which our fans sometimes do nowadays in the times when it really goes downhill is just, yeah, sing louder. Mm. Well, there was, um, I guess you could lock back to even when David Moyes was there and, and, uh, the Liverpool game where they were 3 0 up and, and United fans were singing 20 times, 20 times, right? That's probably the last similar, most similar to this, I'd say. But I think then it was the fans singing in defiance and maybe just pure loyalty, you know, for, for a manager who was clearly out of his depth, whereas this was maybe more of a a backing or an appreciation at least of an outset. So just, just before we get into that really, um, because as we say, it's, it's a, it's a mixed game with a lot of nuance, I guess a good place to start, maybe some statistics uh, on the results. So um, I've got a few for you here, Nick, and I know you love a good statistic. Um, so first of all, this was Mourinho's worst ever home defeat in any competition as a manager. And, and, you know, that spanning the 15 plus years or so that he's been at been at the top of the game. Um, 
it's the first time that Mourinho has lost two of his first three league games uh, for the first time in his career. Um, it's the first time Manchester United have done that for 25 years. And it was also um, Manchester United's biggest loss to Tottenham since a 4-1 defeat in October 1972. And... It's also the 50th home defeat in the Premier League for Manchester United, but 32% of those have come since Sir Alex Ferguson retired. So there's oh, some stats on sort of the... I had, I had one more that I, that I thought you might have rolled up. I think it was the Go first on. time we'd conceded three goals twice in a row uh, since 2012. Ah. Okay. Yeah. And, oh, 2012. Ah, but hold on. Those... Those where we where we considered three goals under Fergie, did we what were what were the results? Did we lose both of those games or my research hasn't gone that far, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Two thousand and twelve, that was Ferguson's last season or maybe the season before. I remember there was a game we did we beat Fulham four three or three two and Aston Villa similar. It was around the time Van Persie joined. And it was some there were quite a few games at the start of Ferguson's last year where we conceded a lot of goals but through Van Pierce, he seemed to score a lot of goals as well. We'll say it was yeah, that. Yeah. Who knows? Someone someone can do the research and, and let us know. But just just to offset I'll do the that, research after and put it in the thread. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Just just to offset those stats which sort of talk about the result in more grandiose terms and, and whatnot. Um a few things to to note. So there was more goal attempts from Manchester United in this game and in the whole calendar year. So in 2018, um, we've had fewer shots in all of the games. So we had 23 attempts against uh, Tottenham Hotspur, and that was more than we've had for the rest of the year. Um, It's also the most shots that Spurs have conceded both this season and last. Um, And lastly, just, just in terms of our approach, not just on the goal attempts, but also perhaps winning the ball back and pressure. Um, Spurs misplaced 38 passes in their own half of the pitch, um, which is the the third most uh, by any team this term. So, um... yeah, I saw their pass success. You know, was you know that's always my favourite stat. Pass success was <laughs> yeah. Tottenham for the whole match, all the way down 67. percent I mean, ours was lower than usual as well at 77. But uh, yeah, it was quite a crazy game from two teams who don't normally play that way at all. No, definitely, and and you know, I think I think those stats do a better job of highlighting how the game was played rather than the result itself, um, than than the former stats. So, I guess I guess on that, first of all, just you were there, you were at the game. Um, clearly, there was a difference in how we approached it and how we set out, and and we still eventually lost. Just talk us through your key thoughts, really, and and your feeling coming out of the game you know your disappointment or or maybe I don't know talk us through it I guess well it was a weird feeling uh I mean came out saying look you know we'd, we seemed quite hard done by by that result and people were, yeah a lot of people were pretty happy just from the way we played especially the way we started I mean the first half mm-hmm. I think everybody can acknowledge and yeah Mourinho was saying the same that we were Unlucky not to be up. I think even Harry Kane said the same in his post-match that look, Spurs were lucky to be at nil-nil by half-time. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the first half I just spent trying to work out exactly what we were doing. I mean, uh, you know, you see the team sheet an hour before and you start trying to get an idea. And a lot of people had been talking about, oh, maybe Matic is going to come in uh, into a three at the back. And you saw, you know, there's yeah. a lot of central midfielders there. And we're, in a way, four central midfielders are on the team sheet. So you're trying to work out who's going to play where. Mm-hmm. And it took me, like, a good half hour into the game till I really <laughs> had any idea of what the kind of system was, who was playing where, uh, you know. And like to, it was still probably the second half that I really said, is Herrera really playing, like, you know, whatever, right back or the right side of a three? Or, it's, like yeah. I said, I'm still not entirely sure what exactly they'd been told and what the plan was. Uh, and also, you know, six changes to the lineup and just threw it out there. I mean, yeah, I think everybody was shocked, including, yeah, all the fans, uh, Tottenham as well. Again, I said, yeah, Harry Kane's post-match comments were quite interesting. He said, you know, we were really surprised how United set up and how they came at us and everything. Yeah. Um, it went like that. But 
that all the fans were, yeah, pleasantly surprised. Uh, you know, it was a weird one being a bank holiday. That means everybody's kind of been out maybe for quite an extra extended pre-match session, up for the match. And then to see the team actually come out and play in a way that we're not used to and has not been seen under Mourinho for long, uh, ever, um, it was just, yeah, yeah. It was, everybody was slightly semi in shock. But yeah, atmosphere was good. Felt like you could get behind it. And it was just that goal that was kind of missing, really. Um, I'm still mm. trying to work out whether this was just him going off for one-off shock tactics or has he decided to completely change his philosophy? I don't know. I guess we'll find out in the next game. Oh, philosophy is a word that I have not missed since Van Hal left us there, Nick. You've you've brought that one back um, at the worst possible time. But yeah, I, I think yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying there. So in terms of the tactics, obviously for those watching TV like myself, we were able to figure out much much quicker uh, that it was a back three, back five, whatever you want to call it, and and that Herrera was on the right hand side of that. I think Mourinho moving to a back three and and bringing in Jones and Smalling to displace Lindelof and by wasn't a huge surprise for a lot of people. And if Matic had filled that centre spot with those two covering him, it wouldn't have been a surprise either. But yeah, Herrera was seemingly a, a strange and an out of nowhere decision. I think he played him there in pre-season a few times, weirdly enough, but everyone just kind of assumed that was because we didn't have Rojo and Jones and, and, by, and other players on uh, pre-season. So that, that was weird to have four central midfielders is is much more of a Guardiola thing than a Mourinho thing but there has been you're right that there has been these response games from Mourinho to particularly against big teams where he has set out with a bit more intent we saw it against Liverpool um until we were 2-0 up last season we saw it against Chelsea in his first season where Rashford and Lingard were up front there has been a few of these games against the big teams where he's actually said you know what we're not going to park the bus um we're going to go at it and and be a bit more open so yeah I guess it's difficult to know like you say whether this is going to be a pattern of sorts or whether this was just a you know a um a means to an end of of the best approach to beat Tottenham rather than the best approach for Manchester United moving forward. Um, but in those first 50 minutes, and like I say, that first half, so we had 11 shots to Tottenham's three. Um, you know, we were all over them, pressing high, winning the ball back quickly and, and also getting it forward quickly. And you're right that, that we weren't a goal up at half time is purely, for me, down to Lukaku's finishing. You know, we, we were... Um, fortuitous or or maybe it was through diligence and, and great high pressing that I think Fred won the ball back out the pitch or and and played Lukaku in. Oh no, in fact it was a back pass from Danny Rose, sorry. Uh, yeah, back pass that from Danny one, Rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lukaku had had the great yeah had had the great thought of mind to to nip in there and to take it round Larice, which was great. But then he didn't look up, he stared down at the ball trusted that he knew where the goal was, didn't see what time he had in terms of any defenders oncoming. And it just seemed to lack composure and, and he missed an open goal. And it was a pivotal moment, right? Because that would have taken us 1-0 up. It would have been breaking uh, the deadlock. And, you know, at that point, that game plan has succeeded in what you would expect it was meant to do in terms of getting that first goal. And that is Mourinho ball, right? That has been his MO since day one, that, he can protect a 1-0 lead. And and whether we would have reverted inwards or dropped back, who knows what would have happened after that. But we know that Mourinho knows, and is very good typically at protecting a 1-0 lead. We know that at that point, hopefully that bit brings a bit of confidence to the team. Hopefully it unsettles Tottenham a little bit further. Um, but instead, we let them get to half-time and regroup. And, and I think it's would you say it'd be fair to criticise Lukaku somewhat for that? Because Yeah, definitely. I mean, that miss was a terrible miss. I mean, he's got probably more time than he knows. Sure, yet. but not even just that. Like There was another couple of half chances he had as well. Um, there was a decent pullback where I thought he should have done better. He had one header as well that he should at least hit the target, yeah. if not score. Um, and yeah, I'd say, you know, he's got probably two half chances and one sitter there. So, yeah, you'd think even two goals wouldn't have been uh, generous, uh, at least one. And it's not just this game, right? You know, against Brighton at 1-0 up. Um, sorry, at 0-0, we 
had him through on goal. Uh, and he takes a touch inside and then he tries to be too clever and he puts it near post. And against Leicester at 1-0 up, again, he was put through on goal. And he tried to be too clever and he missed his shot or the keeper saved. I can't I can't remember exactly, but either way, that's three big chances he's had this season. He just hasn't been clinical with any of them. Yeah, and there's only so much you can go put down to kind of World Cup hangover. Uh, yeah. And this is one of the things about this Tottenham game is that there were so many like excuses for our start to the season. But mm-hmm. against Tottenham, none of those excuses are valid. Because one, some people are saying, look, so many of our players have been away at the World Cup. Tottenham had as many players who went deep into the World Cup, but they actually threw all of their players right in strike from the start. Uh, Mm -hmm. Whereas some of our players came back late and it's only, some of them are only just coming back into the team now, three matches in, you know, Harry Kane and whatever they've been playing since day one of this season. So don't know what kind of discussions gone on in the background or anything there Two, everybody's been saying we didn't make enough signings. Tottenham didn't make any. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, all these big excuses for why our start of the season might not be so great. Go out the window and you play Tottenham because they've had all the same issues. And uh, yeah, what played 3-1-3 at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, that is the big problem. You see Kane, you know, always had this August hoodoo, but has now scored twice in August and the first time against us at Old Trafford. So they're all put to bed. But yeah, whereas Lukaku's missed his big chances. And that's basically the big story in this game, really. The two strikers, he's took his first chance. He's missed his few half chances there. Yeah, exactly. And 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 that is probably there, the two pivotal moments, really, that we didn't take that chance. And then, like you say, they were able to regroup and they score their first corner. Um, and then from there, it just seemed to be a case of Brighton again from a defensive point of view. So we still seem to continue with some intensity and some chances, although... F- you know, for my money, we were creating worse chances than we had in the first half. But again, it just seemed that we were collapsing under the pressure and and our defence just weren't able to cope. And there was mistake after mistake after mistake that led to them having big clear-cut chances that they were able to put the game to the bed much earlier than they should have been able to, whether it's... You yeah, know, I mean, we uh, talked about this last week, didn't we? We, we did. Where you have uh, two goals conceded in quick succession, and it was something that happened so many times the year before as well. Uh, you know, it's a big, big worry that, and I just don't really know what can come in and make the difference from there, really. As we say, we put it, I put it down to leadership, lack of people to get hold of the team and just calm them down after a goal comes in. And for it to happen two weeks in a row is just unforgivable. It is, and and you're right that it keeps happening. And, and there doesn't seem to be an answer, does there? He's he's tried buying Lindelof, he's tried Jones and Smalling, he's now tried a back three with, with Herrera in there. And it doesn't seem to matter who the players are. We we either don't have the personnel for it or he hasn't coached the personnel we've got well enough for it. Whatever it seems to be, there's clearly some sort of mental fragility there. And, you know, people can, can say that this is... It's, it's hard to know what it is and I'm sure it's a combination of a lot of things, but it is somewhat, and I know that you'll in particular hate me for saying this, but it's kind of like the Arsenal Arsenalification of Manchester United in a way, in terms of that fragility at the back, making those big mistakes, having big games where we seem to be playing well, but not clinical and not taking our chances and then then letting team batter us at the other end and, and take theirs. It just feels like we've got such a weak core. Um and that teams are able to really take advantage of that. And that never used to be there. That was never the case for Manchester United. But that know-how, that calm head, it's completely been thrown out of the window as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, the most bizarre thing about it, obviously, is that traditionally Jose's teams are known for being defensively Mm -hmm. solid, strong teams, and then, yeah, getting enough goals to win the matches. And in fact, even, yeah, even under him, yeah, our defence has actually been, defensive record has actually been pretty decent. I mean, maybe it's because he's been playing extra defensively and more negatively just to make up for maybe lack of actually having the players over time. But until this year, where we've now, like I said, conceded three goals twice in a row, we haven't been anything like that before. Um, yeah. But this game in general, it's like this game has come out of some kind of parallel universe where Mourinho is going full on press up front, throwing caution to the wind, uh, getting about, you know, playing centre midfielders at right back and 
well, I don't know. I just I still baffled uh, until we see the next couple of games and see how he sets up, whether it's just a total one off to try and just shock Spurs and go for it. And yeah, look, it almost worked. He went for a massive gamble and it's he's actually it's only down to Lukaku that it hasn't paid off in the end. So really, yeah, he does deserve, I think, some kind of genius, uh, half semi genius credit in there somewhere. But yeah, if we go back to now, go Burnley and just the same like dirge that we've had before. Before, then yeah, I'm not going to be happy about it. Yeah, Imran, Imran is going to be absolutely livid when he hears that you've called Jose Mourinho a genius after a three 0 defeat at home, Nick. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, he should have been on here to defend him, right? I said almost, almost. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, uh, but you you are actually right that it was individual mistakes that that let him down a hundred percent. And you're right, like Mourinho's teams have always had a settled back four. And even even if not a quality back four, at least a settled back four, a back four he knows who are consistent, who he can train to stay in a shape and where everyone, every man knows his job. And that's what he got from Mourinho at first. And and I don't understand how players who've been there since he begun and Lindelof for at least one year now haven't seemed to learn what's expected of them yet, what the other players are doing, because it's not like everything's changing around them. Um, yeah, okay, I appreciate that we jumped into a back three, but it's a back three that they've played before. I, I would often, and I think most people say that back three is typically easier because you've got much more protection and, and cover usually. Um, so, you know, it, it makes little sense. And I guess, you know, one... <laughs> One thing that I would say is that even in the first half where we were pressing so well and we, we did have a high intensity about us, did I don't know if you could notice it from the sounds, but it still felt like there was a coin of a lack in concentration and focus. You know, there was Matic trying to turn against two of them and then essentially breaking into the box. There was a sideways pass from Jones, a sideways pass from... Fred Herrera playing a ball and, and a, back, a poor back pass to the hill. Like, there still seemed to be three, four, five moments of nerve and either nervousness or, um, I don't know, like, uh, mate, I don't know, either, either nervousness or, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Where you too complacency, sorry, either nervousness or complacency where our players were giving them the ball incredibly easy in the last third and they were making some half-decent chances from it. Um, but, you, but your point about defending under Mourinho, Nick, how it's these last two games that it's really turned into a shambles. I have wondered for a while now, and it's something that I've said on the podcast before, is is our defence actually good? Or is De Gea uh, papering over the cracks? Because we've been neglectant and uh, reluctant to talk about expected goals statistics on this podcast. It's not really something we've ever done, but the expected goals against United and the expected goals that De Gea should concede to co- compared to how many does concede, there's a huge contrast. Like in terms of the amount of shots that we have on our goal, we aren't one of the best teams in the league for containing an opposition and and for stopping opposition attacks by any means we're we're in fact in the bottom half of the table for it and yet often season after season we seem to finish first or second or third in the um, fewest goals charts and is that De Gea or is that that we're letting teams have pot shots and stuff but if that was the case the expected goal statistics wouldn't wouldn't reflect those that's reflecting clear-cut chances and we've all spoke so many times about De Gea saving us with big saves whether one-on-ones or stretching arms whatever it needs to be clearly he's been able to influence that statistic and it's something that he wasn't able to do in this last two games so I don't know if the statistics just made us look much better than we were and, and created some sort of false equivalency. I'm not sure, but that I do think there's a, a deeper rooted problem and that has probably been for a while. Um, it's just maybe been less apparent than it is now. Yeah, no, look, De Gea has definitely papered over a lot of cracks and saved us again and again. And I'm sure, yeah, that XG expected goals, part of it is down to that. And also, I don't think it's necessarily because of the, personnel that we've kept defensively sound and maybe this 
is goes to the question of why does Mourinho been playing so defensively? Why was he always parking the bus? And it's because, yeah, maybe he didn't trust the defence to do the job without having an extra couple of yeah. uh, defensive midfielders in front of them. Um, so, yeah, that kind of set up, it all feeds into that. And maybe, yeah, you know, we don't know what goes on behind the scenes or what the questions are, but, you know, from the, we know that this a bit of a fallout for sure between what Woodward and the club may think we need and what Mourinho think we need. And you see, yeah, from one side, they're saying, well, look, you've got five centre backs and you've bought two of them. Uh, But from the other side, he's saying, yeah, well, look, you know, I'm having to play this defensive form of football that fans aren't happy with. Nobody's happy with because what we've got isn't good enough. And it all, you know, it's like a vicious circle. And yeah, I, I still think that in this particular game though, that, when you make six changes, when you change completely the system, when you go and play a pressing game that you've never done before, you can't expect it all just to go to plan and all place. just to be clean. Yeah. Exactly. It's not going to happen overnight. And uh, your best case scenario is that you just shock them, get that first goal and maybe get two if you're really lucky. And then, yeah, maybe go back to something that you're a bit more accustomed to after that. And yeah, unfortunately it didn't happen. And then, you know, by half time, Tottenham get a chance to regroup I've seen what we're doing and then can, yeah, adapt to that accordingly. Um, and that's obviously, yeah, that's what happened in this game. The second half was a totally different match. Plus, yeah. when you're all of a sudden playing the high-pressing game with players who are not 100% match fit, you can't keep up that constant running all the time. We see it with Liverpool as well, where, you know, they end up conceding uh, quite a few goals in the last minutes of matches because you just can't keep up that intensity for our 90 minutes of the whole game, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, 100%. And yeah, our players are obviously even less used to it than they might be who are doing it week in, week out. So yeah, for a half, you can pull that off. But yeah, second half, you could see our players have not got the same legs in them to do it anymore. Yeah, and I think, I think you've touched on some very good points there. So I think that's where the real conflict for me is is on my thoughts on Mourinho in this game and that I want to give him credit because I think it would be unfair for me as someone who said that it's not just the results that matter, but performances as well. And it would be unfair of me to say we lost 3-0 at home and, and whilst that's not good enough to not give credit for potentially the approach that was taken or for the change um, and and for the change in how we played. But the fact that in isolation, this just may be a one-off tactic and maybe he'll use the result as as justification for it being a one-off tactic. It's really hard to get behind because if there was a pattern of him trying to play like this and change the style and, and the results weren't going our way, then you could maybe say, fair enough and you can and as you can say you can maybe understand why he doesn't do that all the time but when it's a one-off game and it doesn't work it's like well maybe if you'd been if you'd you know coached to play this way and you'd brought the players to play this system and the players had been in this system for the past few months and it had been you know a new thing you were trying for a while now then you know there can be more forgiveness around it, I think, than simply trying to just throw something together. And, and essentially, you know, what some people would maybe call, you know, throwing shit at the wall. Um, it, it, it's There's a fine line between the two, I think. And what I do want to do um, before we really go into, you know, Mourinho and post-match and thoughts around um, what this results mean is just to, to make sure that we touch on the positives from the game, the few that there are. So the first of all has to be um, the best player for Manchester United on the pitch was once again, Luke Shaw, right? In your fantasy team, was he captain this week? No, not captain this week, but yeah, he's still in there. And yeah, like, yeah, he's been one of the bright sparks of the season so far. Mm. Um, yeah, one of those few positives. And yeah, early in the season, we said one of the other positives was Pereira coming through. But yeah, he wasn't even involved at all this game. Uh, yeah. That's one of the other slightly bizarre things. And something I always found a bit weird last season as well was where players went from being in the starting 11 to not even on the bench a week after. I mean, in fact, 10 rows behind where I'm sitting in J stand at the start of the thing, we look back and there's Mata and Damian in one of the boxes just right there, sat watching the game, literally like 10 rows behind me. Uh, Damian, I don't know why he's even still around if he's not getting anywhere near the bench and all, what's the point and he's keeping him around. Uh, but yeah, Mata starts the first couple of games, then all of a sudden he's not even in the match day squad. And the same went for Baye Pereira, 
I mean, I do find that a little bit weird, all this, uh, and just how you can keep any level of consistency with players and all, I don't really know. Uh, I don't see that anybody else do. Th- don't know. Is it, is it punishment? I, I'm not sure that it's punishment because we've seen, I, I thought it last, in the first couple of years, I thought it was some kind of punishment. But now I see that those players, they come back in, they come out. Yeah. And I just think that's, yeah, it's, that's his way of doing it. Trying to keep everybody happy. That's just their role. But, you know, we've yeah. always been more used to, you have, you know, a, a 16, maybe 20, because, yeah, there's always a few people injured you come in and out and there there's fringe players as well who might get their chances but players to go from first 11 to totally out of the match day squad is just something that I've never really seen before and I don't know how it affects them mentally and all but maybe yeah maybe now they're used to it and it's not a big issue yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll for, for Damian it was clearly he was just being played because of the World Cup and, and the hangover from that and also maybe to get him in the shop window but Matt definitely is someone who seems to be in and out of the squad with almost zero forgiveness or sympathy or I don't know just it, just pure bash I guess um that I agree on that but yeah, yeah like, like I said last season you know I was kind of feeling sorry for certain players saying oh it's harsh because like, you thought it was like you say a punishment but now I kind of see maybe it's not it's just his kind of way of squad rotation but it's just and maybe too much that, I guess yeah you know, it's but it's yeah. too much for me it's too much change too much yeah, change of style, change of personnel. How can you get that consistency to really be hitting top level week in, week out if you're just changing so much all the time? You're right. You're right. And it's so and it's disappointing that it's his third season and he still I mean, you couldn't even say he hasn't settled on a starting eleven. He hasn't settled on anything, on a formation, on on an eleven, on a back four, on a midfield, on an up front, like there's no settled partnerships in that team there's no player who's doing the same role week in week out or playing the same position week out uh, week in week out playing with the same players around him like how do you build that chemistry um I, you know i just don't see it. and I, and that's something that he's always managed to nail down at all his other clubs and that's what's so strange about this one you know some man some managers are like that and they're just not decisive enough or they don't have a clear plan. But Mourinho's never been that manager previously. He's always seemed to know exactly who he wants and how he wants them to play and who he's going to bring in in a certain game. Whereas this, he just seems to flitter from week to week. And he, and, and and actually, one interesting thing, I think, um, which has probably been prevalent since Fergie left, is that player stock goes up the less they play. <laughs> like the players who are in the team are the players who people... I think are doing poor and then as soon as you don't see them for a while that's when you start thinking of them more whether that's Martial or Rashford if the players on the bench and they don't see the pitch for three or four weeks people rate them higher than the players who we have on the pitch every week it's it's such a strange phenomenon but but talking of phenomenon I, I think just touching on Luke Shaw again like I thought he was absolutely fantastic like he you said he was a bright spark this season you know he was probably the least offensive of all the performers against Brighton and in that first game although we didn't agree with the man of the match he clearly had a good performance for the most mm. part with with a few mistakes but in this game you know whether it's the fact that he was up against Pochettino whether it was because Gareth Southgate in the stands maybe it was because actually this game he was playing at left back not as the default because Valencia was back at right back and Young was there to play and he benched Young instead so a combination of things and also maybe the fact that it was a back five and he had extra cover behind him both in Jones but also seemingly it seemed like Mourinho had given Shaw extra license to get forward and Matic to cover behind him which you didn't really see on the other side with Valencia and Pogba. It seemed to be a specific thing to the left. So, you know, a combination of all those things meant that Shaw put in an absolutely brilliant performance, defensively, but more so going forward. And there just seemed to be a real confidence from him that we haven't seen. Like, he was bringing balls down um, rather than necessarily just heading them on or hoofing them. Like he was bringing balls down with confidence. He was giving the ball and he was driving at people. He was playing one twos, running in behind. He was willing to look up in the box and cut it back. Or um, he would just seem to make the right decisions. And he seemed to do it with a confidence about him. Whereas previously it felt like he was just giving the ball away as quick as he could because he didn't want to be criticised. He didn't want to take responsibility. It felt like he was just getting rid. Whereas yesterday, it seemed like he wanted the ball and he wanted to do something with it. And it was genuinely 
brilliant to see. And, um, you know, I think England's team for a few weekends is going to be announced this Thursday. So, you know, I think it's really going to be interesting to see if he gets a call up because Danny Rose wasn't able to nail that left spot, left back spot down without him. And Ashley Young nipped in and took it in the summer. And obviously Ashley Young isn't the first, um, a long-term choice. And if he's not the first choice for Manchester United left back, how can he be for England? So hopefully there's a real chance for sure there to get back in the England team. And hopefully this can be a real turning point for him. You know, it's there's a long road to go um, because he needs to show that consistency. But he's finally building some match fitness, which he hasn't had in so many years. He seems to be that sort of Rooney type player who really struggles to build match fitness and match confidence up. But once he's got it, hopefully with a run of games, he can sort of cement his place. And and yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to to seeing what comes of him really this season. Have you got any more to say on him? I guess. Yeah, not really. It's just, you know, we. I remember there was that one other bright period he'd had. It was under Van Hal, and it was just before he broke his leg where he was really performing yeah. well and everybody was quite excited about the yeah. player he could be. And then it's always been since then, it never quite been the same and then always had the other odd niggly injury. Then, you know, there was quite a about his fitness and then they also started being all these other questions about his mentality and attitude. And there was a lot of things getting thrown around and, you know, Mourinho was quite openly critical of him on two or three occasions. But then yeah. I saw this summer, there was a few comments from Shaw saying, no, look, the boss has had a chat with me. He's told me what he wants me to do. And yeah, there was things coming out. They'd gone away for special training and been working on his fitness. And yeah, look, if he's really trying to buckle down and say, look, he knew it was, it was or clearly this year was going to be his last chance uh, for make or break for him. And yeah, look, he's taking the chance while players have been away at the World Cup. And yeah, grabbing hold of that place, basically. Like you say, it's the brightest point of the season so far. Yeah, it's, it's insane, the turnaround. I, I, You know, I think I and a lot of United fans just thought he was done. I just thought that was it. I didn't see any, I didn't see any route back into the squad. In all honesty, even though we were so desperate for someone at left back that wasn't Ashley Young, even though Ashley Young's aging, even though we often need Ashley Young at right back, I still didn't see a route back for him because it felt like Mourinho was done with him. And and maybe there's been a bit of pressure from the board to say, actually, you know what, we still believe in Luke Shaw. That that's something that I think may have happened. But I just didn't see it, so it's been a fantastic surprise. And for any of our listeners who are who are managers out there, who are line managers, clearly if you're looking to get a response from one of your team members who's not performing optimally, just call them a fat cunt. <laughs> it's worked for Mourinho and Luke Shaw. Um, and excuse my language, but that's, that's what's happened here, essentially. And uh, yeah, take note, I guess. I think the other, the other positive for me... Um, was that I thought Fred had a really good game? Um, yeah, he had a he had a DC. I've still not quite worked Fred out what exactly he is. What what's his, his role? Is. Yeah, what is his role? It changed every game, right? Well, ex- I don't yeah. know that that's him. I mean, yeah, he was pushed further forward in this match than we've probably seen him, uh, along with Pogba, whereas obviously Matic was sitting. And yeah, he seems to do everything well, but I've still not seen what exactly his best, best attributes are. But yeah, look, he puts in the hard work. He's decent technically. I still want to start seeing whether he's going to, is he going to be a player who's going to actually make goals for us by assisting? Or is he just a player to, you know, like a Kante to do the hard work in the middle of the pitch? Yeah, he seems to be an all-rounder there. But that's, I think that's sometimes our problem. Like even Herrera, you say, look, he's just that kind of midfielder or, yeah. all-rounder who can do a bit of everything and we've got a lot of those kind of players who can fill different roles who are good at everything but we don't have enough players who are great at certain things uh, yeah i think that's i think that's a very good comment actually and i think Mourinho said in the past that he doesn't like generalists players he wants specialists but then he's bought a load of you know he's bought a load of these generalists who can fill in here yeah, and there right. and keep flexible yeah, that's... that's the same point when he's changing systems he needs players who are flexible when he's playing yeah. one week you know very defensively if he's going to go more open then he's going to start pressing then he has to have flexible players uh, it's only you know if you doing the same thing week in week out then you can really go for those more specialists who are just told this is what you're doing every week but yeah if he's going to constantly be changing depending on the opposition home and away then he has to have these more flexible all-round type of players 
Yeah, no, I, I, I do agree with that. And, and I guess all we can really say is that you can't blame Fred for how he's been used so far, that we've had three completely different systems with three completely different sets of players, three completely different tactics. Um, and, you know, he's he's featured in all three. But I don't know, it just seemed to be an energy, it seemed to be a performance full of energy. He, he won the ball back from Tottenham 10 times. You know, and there was a couple of really good balls from him as well. He he played a good ball to Lukaku. He put Luke Shaw in behind. He also had some great delivery offset pieces. And I, and I hope that's a feature moving forward because if there's one thing that we've been absolutely shocking at in the last few years, it's been set piece. Ever since we took Phil Jones back off corners, <laughs> our set piece delivery has been terrible. Um, but I thought his set piece delivery in that game, other than one free kick that hit the first man, was was good. And, and maybe it's just it's been so bad that I'm praising mediocrity here. I don't know. Um, but to win the ball back 10 times and to play a good few key passes and get people in behind. Yeah, he actually had, you're against. right, he had the most uh, four key passes, yeah. uh, three shots mm. as well. So, yeah, but you know. We did look at this, I think, at the start of the season. So he's never been somebody who scored a lot of goals. So I think yeah. he always played a bit more of a defensive role back out in Ukraine. But, yeah, he's yeah. been pushed a lot further forward for us, I think, than he's used to. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem to be out of place in that role. Um, no, not at all. And he, uh, what I would say is that as much as we can, we can sit here and say we don't know what he's great at and we don't know what his role is, well, I don't think you can say that he looks out of place in the league or anything like that. It's more just settling into the team and, and to be honest, having the team settle around him. Like, I don't think he looks out of place in the league. There's been a few times where I think he needs to get used to the lack of time on the ball, but in all honesty, you could probably say that for all our players. There's players who've been playing in the league for 10 plus years who seem to be making schoolboy errors, so... That's definitely not judgment that's reserved for him. Um, but also, it's it's interesting, actually, the trust that Mourinho's shown in him. You know, the majority of players we've brought in from abroad, apart from Pogba and Ibrahimovic, Mourinho's held back on playing them. You know, Lindelof and Mkhitaryan and players like that. Yeah, He's true. been very slow to introduce them into games. And yet he's played Fred in all three league games so far, despite you know, was clearly not being in great form despite chopping and changing absolutely everyone and everything else. Fred has actually been a constant in those three games. Um, one of one of the only ones, really, with De Gea and Pogba, uh, I think. Yeah, I think they're, I think they're the only two other two players. Sure, yeah. And sure, sorry, yeah, who started all the games. So it's really interesting, actually, that he's put that faith in, in Fred and he clearly sees him as an important, as an important player for us moving forward. Um, so I think it's it's probably time to finally talk about, you know, the aftermatch and where our heads are at now after this result, with this all in mind. So, as we mentioned earlier, um, as you were walking, uh, making your way down the tunnel, tunnel, sorry, and, and to the tram, Marino was walking over to the to the fans and applauding them as. Some fans, uh, a, a good chunk of fans, but also a good chunk had obviously left early, applauded him back. And I guess, first of all, just what are your thoughts on that, really? And what do you think he's doing there? And, and what's that signalling, if anything at all? Yeah, I mean, I've seen, you know, I've seen the post-match uh, after today and seen also his comments. You know, he's referred to the fans quite specifically. Mm. I think probably he was quite genuinely shocked himself that he's had the worst home defeat in his whole managerial career. Uh, but yeah, there's a ton of fans there who are not just like applauding and singing, but actually even singing his name. Um, like around me and Jay stand uh, yeah, there was a lot of people singing Jose Mourinho, uh, which might surprise a lot of people out there because I know that the Mourinho out bandwagon is definitely gaining traction now. Um, yeah. I, like I say, I think he was surprised by it himself, uh, so went to acknowledge it. And yeah, it's nice to see him acknowledge it. But yeah, there's a lot about, we know Mourinho's all about, you know, focus on me. And mm -hmm. it's all often talked about, he does it most of all when there's a loss to take it away from players and everything and take everything yeah. on me. And, you know, those comments as well at the end of his post-match where he referenced how many times he's won the Premier League compared to the whole, all the managers in the rest of the league. You know, that's straight pure Mourinho magic that, that everybody's talking about that now. Now, just to finish, do you know that what was the result? 3-0. 3 nil. Do you know what this mean? 3 nil. But also mean three premierships 
and I won more premierships alone than the other 19 managers together. Three for me and two for them. Respect, 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 man, respect, respect. It was when he when he put the three fingers up, and uh, I'm sure every all of the listeners have seen it. He puts the three fingers up to the press. He says, "What was the score today?" Yes, it was three nil three. And he puts his three fingers up and he says, "Do you know what that means? Do you know what that stands for?" And I was <laughs> I was waiting for him to say that it referred to the treble of 2017, where we won the Community Shield, <laughs> the <laughs> the Europa League, and the League Cup, or whatever it was, because he made a point in those celebrations of getting all the players to uh to put three fingers up that's what i was expecting so uh, i mean clearly as far as i'm concerned he's had that comment in the back pocket for years now but he's been waiting for wenger to leave um because obviously last season he couldn't have made that comment and (laughs) all of a sudden it's available to him so uh but yeah i mean it's a fair comment in some ways i do think that you know he's by the media these days there's clearly a lack of I don't know. There's, there's some. He, he treats them with contempt, as contempt. Sorry, as Craig would say, and clearly they don't um, revere him like they used to when he first arrived uh, on these shores. And and he was obviously he called himself the special one, but the media were more than happy to lap it up. And he he was definitely a media darling at first, and sort of adopted by the English press. That was quite clear. Um, but yeah, the last few years he's become more disgruntled and moody, and. Uh, with new managers like Klopp and Guardiola on the scene, um, the press give him a much harder time than they used to. Um, they do give him a harder time, but he brings a lot of it on himself as well. I agree. I mean, that's that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And and I think so. I think in some ways it's a fair comment, but then you know the other part of me says, well, how many? I mean, none of those three were with Manchester United, and two of them were over ten years ago now. So. You know, Wenger could have probably said a similar thing uh, about titles he's won in the past, but I don't think it necessarily is particularly relevant today. Um, But like you say, is it just a a diversion tactic from Mourinho to to pull the pressure on him? I mean, the thing is, he's having to do this a lot, a lot lot more these days, um, which in a way is what brings that drama and and creates a rolling... uh, you know, a rolling assembly of, of critique, I guess, of Mourinho, of, of Manchester United, that maybe would have been in isolation under Ferguson or of Mourinho at past clubs. So I think you're right. He's Calling out the fans was interesting. I think he said something like uh, the United fans are too intelligent. They don't watch TV or read newspapers or watch pundits. The problem is, Jose, they listen to podcasts. <laughs> Clearly... <laughs> Clearly, he's underestimated the median that is podcasts and uh, and the influence that United Hour can have on the fans. Um, he's got that one wrong, but yeah, it was it's interesting to say the least. And I mean, the other thing as well that he says, and he acknowledged the fact. Go on. Uh, I think the commentator asked him a good question about it because he said that look, you know, we got booed when we lost at home to Seville yep. last year, and. This week, yeah. you know, the fans are shouting. And I think it was the commentator who said to him, yeah, but do you think, you know, is that something to do with the style of football? And he acknowledged, he said, yeah, I think they appreciated that we're going for it. The players are putting a full shift in. So if he then goes back now to that more negative <laughs> defensive style that we've all moaned about, after acknowledging that this is what the fans want, that even when we lose, they're willing to sing and support the team if we yeah. play like that. If he now turns his back on that and goes back to that then for me you know it's unforgivable after that because now yeah, he's under, what, you know he's made the point the, himself he's, he's undermining himself yeah, yeah 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 you know and, and and it shows him that even if we lose as long as there's something where we can say all right the team put in a good shift uh they're trying they're pushing you know there's attacking making chances that we preferred that then yeah part the bus and win one nil yeah and that, and and i think that's more than fair and i think you're right that he has to he has to actually act upon that now because, yeah, he's he'd be completely undermining himself. And ultimately, um, I'm in full agreement with that. The, even some of the wins that we've had under him, you know, we beat uh, Spurs in this fixture last season 1-0, but we only had 11 shots. We'd had more than that in the first half yesterday. 
And and that game last year against Spurs and against City when we lost 2-1 and against Liverpool plenty of times, it seems like the players just completely caked their pants every time they got the ball. They didn't they they didn't seem to be able to play with any comprehension uh, under any sort of pressure or in a big game. They were just too fit and they had no idea or no clue how to play. And that wasn't entertaining. Even when we were getting the three points, I know you're very much a person of, in the big games, it's, you know, getting those three points is typically what matters, especially if there's a title at stake. But ultimately, the performance does play a part and, and hopefully this changes things, but after 15 years of him playing this style and playing this manner, I'm somewhat sceptical of whether he can do that. What I would say is that this is a completely unique challenge to Mourinho. Like he, at every club he's been at, he's won the title in the second season, at least, if mm. not the first, then definitely the second. Yep. And this season, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think a title race is on the cards. He's going to have to battle it out for fourth I think that's the mission for this season to cement fourth and I think that'll be tougher than than I believe you think um and he's got to turn around what is two defeats and two three and a losses in a row and he's never one he's never had to do that before but he's also never managed it you know every time things have gone wrong in that third season he's never managed to arrest them and, and wrestle them and turn things around now Again, he's always at least won a title every club so he could leave a success. And at this, he's kind of running to the end of his tether with big clubs that he can be at. You could argue that this is the biggest or or joint with Madrid, the biggest job he's ever had. And I think leaving United without winning a title would damage his legacy even further. Um, so I do think it's important that he wrestles this round. But I just, I find it hard to see him being there next season where he's never really done a full season at any club. But... Maybe he needs to accept that he's going to have to change. Who knows? Um, it'll be really interesting to see how that develops. You know, I think his ego will not be able to take leaving our club without winning a major trophy, which is either the Premier League or the Champions League. And like you say, after this start to the season, the Premier League's already looking difficult. Although it's our worst start since '92. And obviously, yeah, we did win the league that year, but uh, it's a different different era now. Yeah, different era now. <laughs> different ball game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, your likes of yeah, City, Liverpool, even Tottenham are a lot stronger than maybe our challenges were back in those days. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, I yeah. mean, United United have seemed to to publicly back him and say, you know, there's going to be no knee jerk reactions. We're not interested in sacking Mourinho at this time. They're going to say that anyway. Yeah. You know, like those comments don't actually mean anything. I agree. Like whether they think that or not, they're going to say it. Uh, I personally don't think that the club will really be looking to sack him unless this kind of relationship thing between Mourinho and Woodward is a lot worse than it even seems. I mean, there obviously is some kind of discord between them, but I don't think that's unusual. I think, you know, a lot of managers want a lot of players and they don't always get them. I think that's pretty normal in a lot of clubs. I mean, I think we had a more yeah. unique situation for a lot of years with Ferguson, who I think he really almost felt like the club's money was his own money. And I think when he used to talk about mm. no value in the market, he really felt that. Whereas a lot of other managers will say, I'm not interested in how much a player costs. These are the players I want. Go and get them for me. And, yeah. you know, how much they cost or whatever, that's nothing to do with me. That's up to you, you to go and deal with. Whereas I do think, you know, Ferguson did talk a few times in his career where he was upset under the PLC and stuff like that about not being maybe getting the players he wanted or they were a bit slower to deal with things than he wanted. But I think most of the time, he got what he wanted and generally he said that. Um, but yeah, he was a different kind of manager where I think the board and all were happy to trust him. And yeah, he worked with David Gill, obviously, in those days and trust him about where the players were valuing all. But it seems that at the moment, maybe there is a bit of a disconnect with whether they think what Mourinho thinks yeah. is worthwhile is worthwhile for the club or not. There's a there's a battle of egos, essentially, um, in, a, in a big, big way. I mean... Woodwards didn't fire Moyes or Van Hal until fourth place wasn't possible, right? Both times we'd we'd failed to make top four. And with Van Hal in particular, he had backed him 
through a sustained period of absolute dross. If you remember, I think we lost three games on the bounce with Van Halen. Didn't win for like eight games or yeah, something it was a bad run. insane. I remember I went to a lot of them. There was like a loss to Norwich at home. We didn't score in one half of Old Trafford, if you remember, for absolutely ages. Um, we we didn't win a game for eight or something like that. And in the end, you know, we battled City close for fourth and and didn't make it on goal difference. And then, of course, we we dropped him. But it's a case of where do we go from here and whether Woodward's willing to to take that chance because it's easy for for fans to say. And you know, it's a shame that Imran can't be on the podcast to to talk about his thoughts. But Imran is of the opinion that you know managers don't turn these. Things. He started the Jose out bandwagon already. Yeah, he's got the he's he's got the pitch folks out. Yeah, so he wants Mourinho out. He doesn't see how he can wrestle this around, and we'll put these thoughts to him next week. But it's quite easy for us to sit here comfortably and say that. But before Mourinho, we we only got Champions League one season out of three, and in the season we got it, we then went out of the group stages, and the the Premier League is even more tightly contested and competitive at the top now than it was then. And this year under Mourinho, it's going to be a challenge to to get top four with Chelsea's improvement. Next year, if Arsenal improve under Emery as they've spent a bit more time with him, who knows? Like the challenge of getting top four every year is only going to get more and more difficult. And it's a big risk to, to fire a manager who's done that for you two years in a row when you consider what came before him. Um, so it's... I agree. I don't think I don't think the board will be looking to to sack him unless, like you say, it gets to, you know, a point of no return. And 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 one thing, you know, you mentioned last week that you don't think that the the players of, um, you know, that Mourinho has lost the players and that he's lost the dressing room. And I think that was quite quite clear from last night. Right? They put a hell of a lot of effort in, um, and they tried their best. There were individual mistakes which let Mourinho down, but I don't think that any player was you know, not trying there all to get the win there. There was clearly a lot of spirit and and they were hurt by what happened at Brighton that they wanted a response. And then in the end, it turned to desperation. But they were trying and they were trying hard. Um, so I think you're right that the players haven't haven't turned against the manager. So there's no reason really for, for us to get rid of him unless it looks like it ends up spiraling out of control. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, it's it's a difficult game to really commentate on because it's so nuanced and as you keep mentioning it really depends on what happens moving forward mm. if he carries on in a similar fashion then yeah but if he doesn't and he turns back then does he really deserve any any of the credit or the forgiveness and sympathy that that United fans have given him yeah like you say we have to see how it goes from there and uh I for me whatever way you look at it three games into a season you cannot be talking about getting rid of the manager. And that comes from somebody who never wanted Mourinho in the first place, has been pretty critical of him every year so far. But I still would not start talking about getting rid of the manager at this point. Nick, all you need to say is that's come from a top red. <laughs> cool. Um, so moving on, I think, to, to hopefully things... Uh, a little bit more positive. So there's two things I wanted to talk to you about, Nick, before we look ahead to the Burnley game. And that was your escapades over the last week or so. So um, I think there's two things that I want you to discuss. So first of all, before the Spurs game, I believe I've seen in a WhatsApp chat group chat and and uh, we'll probably post it in the thread if someone kindly asks for it. A picture of you with David May, is that right? Yes, yeah. This was my pre-match uh, preparations for this game. And uh, yeah, it's a little group called No Prawn Sandwiches who now started organising these kind of pre-match sessions, getting in next players to do a bit of chat and question and answer before games. And uh, I hadn't managed to make one before. I think they'd had Brian McClare, a couple of other people oh, cool. uh, last season. Uh, I think this was the first one this year. And yeah, David May uh, was over at Morgan's Bar, which is just near the toll gate at Trafford Bar Station. Um, it's also, yeah, quite a good option for a new pre-match venue. Um, but yeah, David May in there. 
telling a few stories, being questioned by Peter Boyle as well. Uh, if people don't know, he's one of our kind of famous fans that used to write a lot of our songs a couple of decades ago. And uh, although, yeah, I had a brief chat with him post match and he was talking about how he's now had to move from J Stan to Family Stan because he's going with his son nowadays. So, yeah, everybody moves on and priorities moving on. But yeah, it was a question and answer session there. A few stories told by David May. Uh, I'll be honest to say, I had actually heard a lot of these stories before from different players here and there. But yeah, it's still cool to hear these things in person. A nice way to kind Maybe of. Maybe our listeners haven't because they're not such top reds as you. So, what I guess what was the the best Q and A and and the best story that he told? I guess what are the takeaway comments? If you can do them just well, you know, one of my favourite stories that, I, like I say, I'm sure a lot of people have heard this story before, but it goes back to the match uh, where Eric Cantona got sent off for attacking one of the fans, uh, and so yeah, May was saying yeah he was played in that game. I think he said he even scored, and he said yeah it was going to be one that everybody remembered me for until Eric decided to jump into the stands. Uh, but yeah, he's told this story. And I think I may have seen I don't know, it might have been Lee Sharp or somebody who'd also told this story quite recently but it come out about how all the players had got ready for the post-match for Eric to get an absolute yeah. roasting from Fergie basically uh, for just you know letting the team down and he, they said they went in there and Fergie's throwing F's and blinds at all the players slagging everybody off that you know whatever Pally you're six foot five how can you have got beaten by whatever I think Gareth Southgate it might have been who scored a goal that day uh, <laughs> wow. and like, yeah having a shouting at Schmeichel and you know because we, yeah we've lost the we've come back there and they've mm. equalized late on and they, everybody's getting a roast in and then yeah somebody's <gasps> Pointed, I think Lee Sharp or something is getting a roasting for this and that. And then, yeah, he's pointed and said, yeah, yeah, you know, what about Eric? And then he's just turned to him and said, Eric, you can't be doing things like that, son. And then, yeah, that's it. Moved on, that's let it. him off and <laughs> yeah. gone on with it. But they said that basically Cantona, Fergie knew which players needed a slagging off to get them going. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. which players needed to be left alone. They said Cantona was never, ever shouted at, never got any hair dryer in the dressing room in front of other players. They said they don't know whether, you know, they had one-to-ones in other places and they might have chatted about things. But yeah, Fergie knew he was a player who needed support. He needed an arm around him. And that's why he'd fallen out with so many authority figures in the past before and never been able to show his kind of genius at uh, various times in different clubs. It always ended badly, but it was the first time somebody just let him do his thing and get on with it. Yeah, um, Yeah, and you know, that talks it, it's relevant to things that are going on today about how Mourinho deals with yeah, different definitely. players you know with Pogba does he react to this kind of thing or is it not good for him yeah. uh, you know it's very relevant to the man in man management we have today yeah epitomizes what a lot of people think was Fergie's greatest strength right is his ability to understand exactly what a player did or didn't need and therefore get an extra ounce out of them you know there is so much talk of Fergie's great teams of that he had um, and how chock-a-block full of fantastic players they were. But then there are also those squads we had where we won the league by 13 points and you've got Cleverley and Anderson in midfield and, and things like that. And and clearly there were plenty of players who he got an extra ounce out of who, who were giving performances that they gave to Fergie, which are just unheard of since he left and since they moved on to new pastures or stayed with United under new managers. Um, so yeah, it's no, that's a, that's a, that's a brilliant, brilliant story. Um, did you get a feel of, of David May? Did you sniff him? Anything like that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Managed to have a picture with him post-match. Sure. The replica European cup in there. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. if there's any requests for it, we might throw that picture in the uh, thread there. The thread. Um, Definitely, I think we should. The other, the other thing that you've got up to, I believe, um, and we mentioned it on last week's podcast, is you went to the first United, well, United Ladies home game. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Historic occasion. Uh, I think you need to call it United Women's. Yeah, it's all quite PC nowadays. You can't call them ladies anymore, apparently. Apologies. Uh, but yeah, it was the first home game of the new United Women's team. Somebody did actually remind me that it's not the first ever 
United women's home game because we did have a team, whatever, 15 years ago. Uh, but I think, yeah, now they're more professional and it's definitely a different level than anything we've had yeah. before. Uh, so, yeah, it was the first game down at Lee Sports Village, um, which is actually a bit of a trek to get to. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, it's out in like East Manchester going out towards Liverpool and I don't like ever going towards that way, you know, <laughs> towards places Gally's like about. Wigan and Bolton and Liverpool that are, yeah, right off my radar. Um, but yeah, it's actually a nice new little complex over there. I think the capacity of the stadium is something like uh, ten or 12,000. Uh, okay, not bad. Yeah, it's like our youth teams play there as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was the highest turnout, I think, for... I'm not sure if there's any... No, not a, it was the highest turnout for this particular tournament because this is the Women's Cup. Okay. Uh, it's quite a random format. We're in a group of five. And our first game, we beat Liverpool. This was our second game against Reading women. And unfortunately, yeah, we lost the match. 2-0. But it was actually quite a good Why game. Why fortunately? Yeah. Why fortunately? Or did you say unfortunately? No, I said unfortunately. Unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the connection issue. Of course. Yeah. I said unfortunately. <laughs> uh, we lost this match 2-0. Um, it, it was 0-0 at half time. Reading scored early in the second half. They then had a player sent off and it was really quite a tense last portion of the game where we were pushing to get that equaliser. And because it was a cup game, it would have actually gone to penalty shootout. Uh, straight mm. to penalty shootout. No extra time if it was drawn at uh, nine minutes but yeah unfortunately while we were pushing for that extra goal Reading got a second one and it was game over um, but yeah we've got a very young team you know this team's only been thrown together like a couple of months ago basically so everybody's still getting to know each other I mean our standout player is Alex Greenwood who's uh, yeah. England international and I think yeah we mentioned her but yeah I could see like it's the first time I've seen the women play and I'm seeing a lot of these most of the players for the first time but she stands out by a mile there's just been right. a totally different level to all the different players there and in fact I was sat at a place where she was quite close to us and I could see in her face that she was often getting quite frustrated by obviously not mm, thinking that some of the other things yeah the yeah. other players are maybe not quite on her level or not reading what she's doing but yes yeah, like mm. i say it's early days for this team and uh, it's just yeah like and to get the turnout there i think it was around 5000 people showed up oh, uh, yeah it was a really, it was quite felt like quite a family day out i mean i went with my yeah. daughter it was the first game of football she's ever been to and i wasn't Did sure she got a united top uh, she's not got a United top, oh, but she knows which man. team she supports. No, I'm not into all that merchandise. <laughs> okay. The last United top I bought myself was in about 1993. Uh, but um, she knows which team she supports. And um, yeah, there was a lot of kids there, loads of girls. And I'm assuming, like my daughter, a lot were going to a football game for the first time. I was actually quite surprised because I thought my little one yeah. would want to go home after about half an hour. So, uh, so I was just taking seriously. But she actually lasted for the whole game. And I was almost thinking about... Enjoy it? Uh, yeah, I think she did. Yeah, yeah. Just seeing what it was all about. And yeah, there was like a nice okay. little decent atmosphere. Like I say, a little felt like a really good family atmosphere. And I'd recommend anyone maybe to go and check it out. It's only like five quid for adults and 250 for kids, which like is like, you know, dirt cheap, basically. So yeah, worth well, it just for a little day out to see something different and yeah, support the new team coming through. Most of our London listeners won't be able to buy a Freddo with five quid. So you know. yeah. Makes makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's and, brilliant. Uh, yeah, Ed, Wood, Ed Woodward was in attendance as well. He was oh, in really. The, yeah, yeah. He was in the stadium that day. Obviously, he was in the VIP section a long way from where I was sat. Uh, so you didn't get to have a chat with him. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. But yeah, he <laughs> yeah. was there at least, so he turned up to support the women. Uh, but yeah, look, it's a good initiative. I think they get their actual league campaign started this weekend. The first couple of games being cup matches. Uh, and yeah, I'm, we'll keep an eye on them throughout the season. Fantastic. Oh, well, that's brilliant to hear. As we mentioned last week, I think between Nick and mostly probably Craig, who has an MUTV subscription and uh, and just loves United, will try and cover and report back on, on how the women's team are, are doing as the season progresses, I guess. But yeah, it's, it's obviously brilliant to hear that you had a great day out and um, hopefully they continue getting decent attendances. I'm sure that, you know, it'll tail off and whatnot, but hopefully uh, they still get a a more than healthy number. Um, so I guess, you know, be, before we before we go today, it's really worth 
looking at this Burnley game because it's 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 an important one. It's just before an international break where you know it's it's never great to not get a result because you then stew on it for two weeks and and think about it. And I think it can set in some negativity. I think it's important to always make sure you get a result before before a uh, an international break, but also after two losses already, three games into the season, and a 3-0 loss at home, it's obviously, you know, more important than ever. Um, so, last season, we drew 2-2 with Burnley at Old Trafford, um, but managed to beat them 1-0 away in the same fixture. Um, and, and they finished seventh last year. Um, but they seem to be, they seem to be, a little bit troubled this year. So for those of you who, who aren't keeping up, they, because of their fantastic uh, season last year at finishing seventh, they of course got into the Europa League. And as we all know and love um, that Thursday, Sunday schedule is in all honesty, a bit of a bitch. And, uh, you know, a lot of players and managers have spoken about how the, the impact that that can have. And Burnley are really struggling seemingly as a result so um they've lost their last three games so that includes a four nil loss to fulham and a three one loss to olympiacos so they're clearly leaking goals for a side who've typically been known for being so defensively diligent and having such a fantastic record at the back um the the addition of joe hart over the summer has just clearly opened the floodgates essentially um you know whether they'd be better playing without a keeper i'm not sure but they, they're really struggling, Nick. Yeah, and I don't think it's that much of a surprise. I think we've seen this in other teams who are going to Europe for the first time. And when all of a sudden they have to go from playing once a week to playing twice a week, uh, it's a whole different scenario. And they've not got the biggest squad either. Yeah, it's, it's a modest team with modest budgets. So before last season, they finished 16th. And that they finished 7th last season was more a case of good coaching and team spirit and whatnot. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. And, you know, he's got to have massive credit yeah. to him for finishing up there. But, yeah, yeah, I think it's a big ask for a team like that and their budgets and number of players to deal with, like, playing that twice a week. Uh, mm. They've got what? I think they've still got their second leg to play yet, haven't they? Yes, Against Olympiacos, yeah, so they are still in the Europa League. Um, they lost 3-1 away from home. So they did get an away goal, which is something. It's not the worst result ever, 3-1. Um, so it's not all lost for them. I would like to see them get that reward. But they do need to get two goals. Yeah, I mean, it's a big ask for them. But yeah, it would be great for them to get yeah. that reward of playing there. But at least their fans have had a few uh, Euro trips. Although, yeah, I know one of them was only to Scotland. Uh, I think they <laughs> yeah. then went out to Turkey for a game. Yeah. And uh, at least they've had, you know, something that, like that, something to celebrate for them. Um, but yeah, it, it, like I say, it was absolutely expected when teams like that end up there. And yeah, for us, then it means we've got really no excuses at all for not going and getting a result here now. Uh, it couldn't be like a better time to play them, really. Uh I'm not even going to hazard any guesses at who's going to be playing, what kind of system we're going to go with. Uh, just, yeah, haven't got a clue. Well, Lukaku can't miss any more chances, Gill edge chances against Joe Hart, right? Yeah, sure. I assume the only, pl- the only player who's not going to be playing is Phil Jones because he's obviously injured again. Well, yeah, he's injured more often than he's not, right? Um, and typically after a mistake from him as well, he, he's trotting off but yeah I, you know I don't want to be potentially too harsh on him but yeah they've obviously it's it's incredibly unfortunate because they had Tom Heaton who you know ex-United keeper right who performed fantastically for them over the last few years he's been absolutely brilliant for them both in the championship and coming up to the premiership and he got injured and that was a huge blow he was one of their best players and they replaced him with Nick Pope who in the matter of half a season managed to work his way into the England mm-hmm. squad for the World yeah. Cup ahead of Joe Hart who had who had had a cemented position for the last five or six years or however yeah. long it's they have been. got three yeah three England keepers I think they're the only team who challenge us for having the best three goalies in their squad basically <laughs> Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's that's a very very fair point. And yeah, obviously Nick Pope was brilliant as well. And then now he's injured, and and now they've got Joe Hart, who I don't know if you saw. Have you have you seen the goals from Fulham? No, I have not seen. Uh, it. Okay, I mean, so they lost four two to Fulham. They were clearly absolutely knackered, but also like a few of the goals, you're just kind of thinking, what's Hart? 
doing. He's he, like his confidence is absolutely shot now. I think a lot of United fans never rated him the same way that a lot of England and, and obviously particularly City fans did before Guardiola came in. But he was a much better keeper than he seems to be showing himself to be the last season or two. Like his confidence has clearly taken a massive hit. And maybe you just think it's because he doesn't get the same protection now than he used to. But as far as I'm concerned, he just seems to be, he just seems to be in a bad place, which as much as he's quite a loud mouth and a big gob, it's not, it's not something you like to see, right? Or maybe it is Nick. I don't know. Yeah. I actually don't mind seeing those kind of characters and all, but, uh, <laughs> I'll also be very happy to be sticking a couple of goals past Harty. Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's a fair point. But is it not? Would it not be classic Joe Hart to then have a fantastic game against us? It know? would be, and uh, I think he has kept a couple of clean sheets uh, mm. early this season already. I know they conceded quite a few last week, but I think before that they did keep a couple of clean sheets, didn't they? Um, or maybe that was in the Europas. And I just remember seeing it was the first time they'd conceded or something like that. He'd had a few clean sheets in a row. Um, but yeah, I don't know if they've brought in many reinforcements over the summer. Uh, I know they did do a bit of transfer business just to literally bring in bodies, but no like big names or anything really, that European budget. It was mostly Joe Hart and um, Ben Gibson from Middlesbrough, sends yeah. back for yeah. 15 million or so. And he's a good player, but yeah, you're right. Nothing to really ride home about and when they're like you say entering into Europa they really needed reinforcements if they were going to make a real go of that but they haven't been able to um so yeah it'll be it'll be interesting now we haven't actually lost to Burnley in just short of 10 years so it was August 2009 when we last lost to Burnley Nick I don't know if you remember that game it was similarly right at the start of a season and uh, Robbie Blake scored a goal in the 19th minute oh, yeah. for them to win one nil at Turf Moor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah do you yeah. want to know? Do you want to know what our team was that day? Go on. The go starting on. lineup. This was 2009. Yeah. So in goal we had Ben Foster. Right. Our defence was Wes Brown, Johnny Evans, John O'Shea, and Everett. <laughs> uh-huh. um, in midfield it was Anderson and Carrick with Giggs and uh, Park G-Sung on the wings, and then Michael Owen and Ro- Wayne Rooney up front. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, I do like those blasts from the past teams. But yeah, yeah I think yeah. that must have been when Burnley, that was their first season in the Premier League ever, right? Yeah. And then they've gone back down and done well to come back in again. I think they went back down, and then they, they've they've had two... This is actually their second spell under Sean Dyche, though. So they came up... Mm. In like I don't know, thirteen, fourteen for one season. I think went back down, had a few seasons in the championship, and have come back up again. So they not only did he get them promoted the first time when he got when they were relegated, they stuck with him and he's brought them back up. Which let's be honest, how often do you see that these days? Do do you ever see that these days? Ever? I don't think so. Right? Rarely that you know they'll stick with the manager yeah. and give him the chance to come back again. You do see these teams who yo-yo somewhat, whether it's Newcastle, whether yep. it's... It used to be West Brom quite often, right? Norwich have gone down and come back up. There have been teams who've done that, but it's rare that they've got the same manager as when they went down. So it's fantastic to, to see that he's done that. And like you say, to to go from 16th to 7th last season is is a fantastic feat and, and all credit to him. So yeah, we haven't lost in nine years. Like I say, last season, it was a 2-2 draw at... Um, home and a 1-0 win away from home the 2-2 draw at home was that weird game where they went 2-0 up they had that uh, Stephen uh, Defoe is it um, free kick to go 2-0 mm-hmm. up and then Lingard it was actually one of the first games that Lingard really came to the fray and saved us which was something he obviously ended up doing a lot last year but he, he scored um, a goal around the 50th minute mark and then he scored a last minute um, equaliser as well I think it was a screamer. I'll have to check. But. Yeah, and that was actually one of the things that we talked about, that last year we did have quite a few decent comebacks. Mm. Uh, and yeah, we're hoping that that would be something we could take forward with this team. But yeah, it's not happened this week. But yeah, hopefully we don't even need to have that comeback performance. We can start off on the right foot for once. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there needs to be a reaction of sorts, right? Even though the team played well, If you, when you lose 3-0 at home, you've... Surely, I mean, they've got to come out the traps. Um, one thing I'd say about the Spurs game was that it's one of the few games under Mourinho in the last year or so where we've had a good first half. Mm. I feel like 
it's rare that we start well under Mourinho. Usually we have a terrible first half and then improve in the second. And like you say, quite often end up coming back from going behind. Um, but Spurs, we actually started well and, and the opposite was true. Um, so maybe maybe that needs to be the game plan here, that we start terribly, let them come on to us, let them score a couple of goals and then uh, and then we turn it on in the second half and Jesse Lingard can, can bang a sc- free screamers in and get a hat trick. That seems to be the only clear game plan. Well, I take that. I take that, but I, I'm I'm pretty sure that's not the best way forward. But yeah, then I mean, like you say, each time you lose a game, then the next game is a massively important. I mean, we talked about saying the Spurs game is massively important. When you lose that, now yeah. Eli, even a draw is not good enough. It's really yeah, it's got to be a win. It has to be a win, yeah. Especially like I say, when you then have two weeks to stew on it over the international break as well, and the period that the media will will have uh, a go at that too it's just it's it's just really not what the club needs but the problem is Burnley are a very tough opposition particularly when they're at home yeah we know exactly what Burnley are going to do uh, we do that's the one thing that he can at least plan for that unless unless he does a Mourinho and throws out a full press against us <laughs> but yeah mm. I doubt it um yeah we know how Burnley are going to play and yeah in fact I do actually like, I've always liked their, you know, the way their strikers play. Last season, I got slagged off for saying that. I remember that Lukaku should play a bit more like the Burnley strikers. <laughs> but uh, you know who the strikers were? I think it was uh, <laughs> Ashley Barnes last year, but uh, it might be Chris Woods this year. Right. Uh, we'll see who goes from there. But yeah, like I say, uh, I still think that Lukaku needs to learn these kind of things that you see from Burnley strikers when they're totally isolated on their own, but they still manage to hold the ball and actually play other people in, whereas there's just too many yeah. times that Lukaku is not managing to make that ball stick when it's coming into him. I com- I completely agree. Like the, For me, like one of the revelations for me last season was how good Lukaku's link-up play was in terms of facing goal. Yep. Like He was flicking balls, doing back heels, playing people behind. Uh, playing really great through balls, he was he had some fantastic crosses from the wings, and he ended the season with seven assists, which is you know great for a striker, a goal scoring striker. The likes of Kane, who you know you could argue are a bit more selfish maybe and do score a lot more goals, but only had two, and you know a lot of strikers similar numbers, zero, one, or two. So to get seven assists was fantastic, and his link up play facing goal was great. But when you put the ball into him and he's facing away from goal. It's terrible. Like under Ibrahimovic, we could use Ibrahimovic as an anchor of sorts, where we would use him as a linchpin at the top of the pitch. We would give him the ball, and he would hold it up, and we could move our players forward, and he would play it off, and we would essentially pivot around him, and he would be the anchor that we pull ourselves forward. You know, like you're tugging on a rope essentially, and, and bringing the team forward as a whole. But on Lukaku, we play it into his feet, and if his back's to goal, it's very, very rare that he manages to keep it or play it off, and we're able to start a counter attack. And you're right that that and his finishing and particularly in clear cut chances needs to be uh, where he improves. So I'm in complete agreement with you there. I'm assuming that Sanchez will be back in for the sake of all our fantasy teams. I think I'll probably be dropping him for Hazard this week. I'd sold I'd sold Sanchez already. And uh, in yeah. fact I sold Sanchez for Mikatarian. Oh <laughs> uh, I've got Mikatarian so I can't say anything but still <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I've actually been pushed down to second place now. I'd been leading that uh, our little fancy league so far. I should have actually looked at who's top of it. But uh, I had a terrible. If somebody's week. top of it, if you're on Red Cafe or on Twitter, give us a shout out, and uh, we'll give you a we'll call you out on the pod next week for being whoever's up there at the moment. Yeah, I'm having I'm having a terrible time. I started really well, and then basically the more decisions that I make. Uh, the worst that I seem to do. So I've gone from first to ninth somehow, which is really disappointing. Um, but top of the league is Boring Red Devils, Devakar D. Okay. Um, Give us a shout, Devakar, and uh, we'll, we'll see if you can keep up there. I'm only just behind you, though. I'll, I'll get back in my top spot. So he's 11, he's 11 points ahead of you, Nick. Yeah, I think he had Mitrovic or somebody. That was his star player this week. Mitrovic, Mitrovic who's done a couple yeah. of goals. So, yeah, might have to look at signing him up. Mitrovic, Monreal, Robertson. Some bit, some 
some names in there you that you wouldn't expect to be scoring big points who've done him a job. He actually had Bamba on the bench with eight points as well, um, which he must have been kicking himself, yeah. Oh, he'll be kicking himself. Unlucky, but good going, definitely. And uh, Nick and you can, can have a race for for fourth spot while um, me and a few others sweep in and take first later on in the season, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, it's early days yet. That's it. Not getting too excited about anything. As like I said, as, as much as don't get, we're not getting too downbeat about where our actual team is, not getting too excited about where my fantasy team is. <laughs> uh, that is words of wisdom right there. Um, and I think that's probably uh, a good place to end the podcast, I'd say. Um, so thank you very much for listening and we'll see you all next week cheerio laters